All right, hi, my name is Shalini Mishra. I'll be filling in for Professor Stokholz today. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Planning Policy and Design here at UCI. I got my PhD in Planning Policy and Design, uh, specializing in environmental psychology uh, about two years ago. And since then, I've been working on a project about the science of team science, which you probably would have heard of in uh, some of the initial lectures that Professor Stokholz gave. Um, my research interests uh, lie in the area of virtual environments, and specifically how virtual environments and the, the internet and cell phones affect our social behavior and our physical health. But today, we will be talking about this um, broad area of interpreting the environment. So specifically, we'll be talking about environmental cognition. So you had this reading uh, by Russell Schweikert about space age and the planetary of awareness. So this is an astronaut who participated in the Apollo 9 mission in the late 1960s, I think 1969. And um, he had the opportunity to participate in a number of uh, astronautical feats. And what this 10-day experience did for him was to change his perception of the Earth as a planet and his relationship to the living beings on the Earth. So he went around the Earth 151 times throughout those 10 days, every one and a half hour. And what happened was that he began to see the Earth not as a big thing with all its details and all its borders and boundaries, but as a little thing in a, in a vast universe of the space. So he began to objectify the Earth and see it without all its borders and boundaries. And I like this quote a lot from, from the reading. He says, when you go around the Earth in an hour and a half, you begin to recognize that your identity is with that whole thing. That makes a change. You look down and you can't imagine how many borders and boundaries you cross, hundreds of people killing each other over some imaginary line that you are not even aware of. You wish you could take each by the hand and say, look at it from this perspective. Look at what is important. So he was able to see this Earth as a tiny little object which you could block out with, with your thumb. Um, and, and he was an American, of course, and he, in the beginning, he started at identifying with his city, you know, the city that he was brought up in, Houston, that he worked. But as time went by, he began identifying with other cities and the whole country and then other countries. So environmental perception, this is where environmental cognition and environmental perception come in. The perspective with which you take to look at an object or an environment makes a big difference in guiding your thoughts, actions, and behavior regarding that environment. So this brings us to the differences between objects and environments. So objects re require subjects, and in contrast, one cannot be a subject of an environment, only a participant. So what this first point is talking about is the relationship that people have with their environments. People or individuals and groups are participants in their environments rather than being subjects in their environments. What that mean, means is that there is a dynamic relationship between people and environments. What you do affects the environment and, what the, envi and the environment in turn affects your physical health, your behavior, your, your emotions. And that is not true in case of subjects. Let's think of the example of looking at the earth from hundreds and thousands of miles away. Uh, you are not a participant in that environment. The environment does not surround you, or the, uh, the object doesn't surround you. Environments do surround the individual. Environments engage multiple sense modalities. You can kinesthetically move in your environment. You can sense it, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can smell it. You can't do all of those things with an object. Objects, by far, may engage only one or two sense modalities. Environments offer peripheral information. That means you can perceive things in your environment. You can see what's around you. Objects do not do that. Environment perception always involves action. So you have the potential to act, behave. Action means behavior. Uh, once you perceive something in an environment and have the chance to, um, to uh, uh, process that information. Environments convey symbolic meanings and messages which objects may not. So for example, temples, churches, cities, and hometowns of people, they have special meanings. They hold special meanings for people, and objects might not. Environments have an ambience or an atmosphere. So think of your favorite coffee shop that you go to. Um, it has a special atmosphere that you like being in, that you like working in. Objects 
do not have an ambience or an atmosphere. So this framework is one way of explaining the field of environmental psychology. All of the research areas in this discipline come under these forms and phases of transaction. This discipline. You can think of you know, two forms of transaction and two phases of transaction in this two by two table. So you have the cognitive phase and, um, and the behavioral, or the cognitive form and the behavioral form, and the active phase and the reactive phase. So what does that really mean? Cognitive, anyone knows what cognition means? Exactly, involving thoughts and, and emotions. So cognition involves knowledge act, and emotions. And behavioral involves actions. actions. Phases of transaction, the active phase. Any, any ideas of what active could mean in this sense? Exactly, when you're actually guide your, the environment is guiding your behavior and you bring thoughts and goals into that environment with the purpose of acting in that environment. And reactive, any ideas what reactive could mean? Exactly, passive responses to the environment where you're not truly aware of what is happening but you are reacting to the environment without your knowledge uh, that the environment is having an influence on you. So this could be physical, emotional, behavioral, any different forms. So then each of these dyads have different names, interpretive, operative, evaluative, and responsive. You're not going to talk about, you're going to talk about all of these throughout the class, but we're going to focus on this first dyad, interpretive, uh, with, this week, and specifically on the cognitive representation of the spatial environment. So, this brings us to an important concept in, in environmental cognition, and that is of a cognitive schema. What do you think a schema is, and why is it important? Yes, it's like a mental map, a conceptual framework that guides you know, how you evaluate and understand your environment. It's not very complicated. We have schemas of everything around our world, and we, do not, we can't see a schema, you can't touch a schema, it's just a framework to understand mental processes. Just think of it as a word or as a construct that helps us understand um, these mental processes. So it's a mental representation of the world around us, and the world around us could be the spatial world, our social relationships, uh, the combination of socio-physical relationships, cultural relationships, and a schema provides symbolic categories with which we can make predictions about the environment and evaluate alternative plans of action. And we'll talk about that a little more in the following slides. So what is a cognitive map? A cognitive map is a type of schema, but it specifically pertains to the spatial environment. And how are cognitive maps externalized? We can't see a cognitive map, but one way of externalizing cognitive maps that people have is by asking people to draw sketch maps of their particular environments. And can you tell me what you understood about cognitive maps from the Lynch reading? You had the Lynch chapters. Um, what do you think a cognitive map is and how is it different from other maps? Ah, excellent, excellent explanation. So cognitive maps are not cartographical maps. Cognitive maps are different for every person. It's not an objective representation of the environment, but it's a subjective kind of uh, representation of how we think of the environment. We bring our own values, our thoughts, our experiences, our past experiences, in the way we understand our environments, our spatial environments, and that's what these cognitive maps could reflect. It's a, it's an indirect way of getting at our experiences and values and uh, emotions and perhaps our past experiences as well. Let's talk about cognitive mapping, okay. So cognitive mapping simply is the process of acquiring information about the environment. It's, it's pretty much simple. We're making, we're cognitive mapping. You can think of that uh, when you enter a new environment, you're mapping the environment all the time without your knowledge about it. So. Um, we're, we're engaging in this process of negotiating and understanding our environment and making schemas about our spatial world. And that's, that's just the process of making, uh, a process of acquiring information about the spatial environment. So before we go into elements of cognitive map, I want to show you uh, why are cognitive maps important? All right, that was a little bit dramatic, but what, what's the point? Why are cognitive maps important? Why is it worth studying this in environmental cognition? How, what, how do you feel when you go into a new environment that you're not able to negotiate? Suppose when you're traveling, for example, without a, a map and you get lost, where you don't have a clear cognitive map of the environment. Yes, stressful, exactly. You need cognitive maps to organize your environment, to have some framework of the environment. So what, what do you think about you know, why cognitive maps are important? 
excellent, excellent to make decisions about the environment. You know, how can we guide our behavior if we don't know anything about our environment, if we haven't organized it? Excellent point. Other examples? Yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Unfamiliarity with an environment can lead to a lack of exploration, for example, of the environment. That's good. Good point. And, and personalities guide that behavior. Great. Other, other thoughts? Yes? You can tell us about how, um, how connected people feel to their environment. Because if they have a very detailed map, then they might be connected to more places. They might be interacting with their environment a little more thoroughly. But if they have kind of a vague or incomplete map, then maybe it says how committed they feel or how part of it they feel to their environment. Wonderful, exactly. That's, and, and you know, you have a reading about, about this, this fact in, um, in the Milgram and Joe Delay article about the psychological maps of Paris, which is exactly about these points. Excellent point. You're already an environmental psychologist. So this urban planner, famous urban planner Kevin Lynch, was very interested in cognitive maps. And he took this concept and tried to see how people experiences, experience their cities and how they interact with them with with the aim of designing better environments, better cities. And what he found in his research of Boston, Los Angeles, New York, many different cities, is that invariably these cognitive maps of people have these five elements. So one of the elements are paths. Anyone can tell me what a path is in, in terms of cog, uh, Kevin Lynch's conceptual framework? Yes. Yes, exactly. It's a channel through which people and vehicles can move through and it's it's a passageway exactly what it means you know in the English as opposed to a lot of scientific concepts which you know say something and mean something else path is exactly that so what's an example of a path in UC Irvine ring yes road. Yeah. ring road ring road exactly yes was that your answer yeah. oh I'm sorry any other examples of path Back bay, yes, ex excellent. So let's look at the definition of a path. A channel along which an observer moves, maybe streets, walkways, transit lines, canals, or railroads. All right, let's look at edges. So what's an edge, according to Kevin Lynch? It's, it's not considered a path. You can't move along it, but it's kind of a separation element between two areas, is what you're trying to say. That's right. Any, any example of an edge within our community, Irvine, or UCI, look at it in terms of a larger scale environment, yes. Yes, bridges could be a path, it could be a, an edge as well, it depends. Like the Watson Bridge separates University Center from the main campus, for example. Yes, that's, that's a good example. Other, yes. Yes, that's a very good example. Of a, or the shoreline that we have, you know, the Pacific Coast, that's, that's an example of an edge, you know. A thing that is not really used as a path but that you know, physically separates this area, the city, from another element. Excellent. All right, let's look at the definition. It's a linear element, that's it. So it has to be a straight line, or almost a straight line. Not used or considered paths by, observe, by observers. Shores, ra uh, railroad cuts, edges of development, walls, etc. Everyone clear with the concept of edges? I find that usually students have, yes. <coughs> Mm -hmm. where it's really not used very much, like, like a block of private, like there was private land or government land or something that people don't have access. Yeah, like a no man's land. Excellent. Yeah, that's excellent. That, that could be an edge. Because suppose, think of the borders between countries. You know, there's always a space between two countries which is not really considered anyone's space. That's kind of a transition space, and that could be considered an edge. If that border is not just an imaginary border on a map, but it's defined by some physical element. Suppose it has uh, a wall, or um, a group of hills, or a shoreline, or a railroad, then that border would be considered an, uh, an edge. It does, it's not an imaginary line or a border. Let's look at the other elements. Districts. The UCI campus is a district itself in terms of the Irvine city as a whole. Any examples of districts within the campus? The social sciences, quad, around here, maybe that's, that's a district. Other examples, yes? Like the different housing, like Mesa or Midland. Good, yeah, that, that, that's a great example of a district. Yes? The student center? 
Yes, very good example of a district, exactly. Another example, there are lots of little districts. I think our campus is kind of organized that way. What's the definition of a district? You already said that, so it's, it's a medium to large section of a city having a two-dimensional extent, so it's a plane, a two-dimensional extent, which the observer mentally enters inside of, which could be physically enters inside of as well. So that's an example of Central Park in New York City or Manhattan. That, these are examples of Times Square. That's an example of a district. Okay, next. Nodes. What are nodes and examples of nodes? Exactly. Lots of people, streets, you know, intersect with each other. Excellent, excellent definition. What's an example of a node? Student center, exactly, student center, great node. That's like our public square. Other examples. Aldrich Park could be a node, it's pretty, it's pretty big, but it's like, it's a, it's a place, it's not, it's circular, so that kind of makes it hard for it to be a node, but there are passageways in between, so you could, in a sense, consider it a node because it connects, you know, the passageways connect uh, to the social sciences, to the biological sciences, so in a way you could, but it's more of a district, I would say, Aldrich Park. All right, examples of nodes in, in the city. Does, does Irvine have a node? Irvine is not a traditional city to think of uh, for nodes, but maybe it could be. So nodes, it's a strategic point in a city which the observer can enter, primarily junctions, crossing of paths, a square, a street corner hangout. So for example, so that's Times Square, that, that could be a node, or the Grand Central Station in New York City, that's an example of a node. Just think of it as a place where Many people meet, many paths cross, and it's an interaction point. So the flagpoles, for example, at, at, um, in, in UCI, that's an example, a good example of a node, because that's where you know, people come in to the, the buses stop there, and that's an example of a node. Landmarks, examples of landmarks. Statue of Liberty, excellent example. So it's a, it's a memorable piece of architecture, could be a sculpture, could be a building. Uh, that provokes, you know, that makes the place imageable. So that's, that's an example of a landmark. I think Irvine has a lack of landmarks. Yes? I was going to say the airplane hangers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, prob that could be, that could be. Yeah, that's huge and, and it, could, it could, you know, pass as a landmark because it's something visible and, you know, mem memorable. So landmarks is a type, type of point of reference. Is, you have to think of it when you're thinking of examples, you think, is this a point of reference? But the observer does not enter within them. Maybe a building, a sign, or a store. All right, so one of the concepts that Kevin Lynch and uh, Milgram and Joe Lake studied was imageability, or the qualities of a physical object or environment that give it a high probability of evoking a strong image or memory in the observer. So for example, Paris. Paris is a very imageable city. London, a very imageable city. New York City, very imageable city. Any examples of, in your experience, about imageable cities, small towns, or large-scale environments, what would you consider an imageable? Yes? So the orange balloon in the Great Park in Irvine? Yes, could be, you know, although it's not really visible from everywhere, but you know, it could be, maybe that's a mark. Yes? Does it have to be man-made? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, in this context, I think Kevin Lynch thought of it as being something man-made, but and especially in urban environments, because he was not thinking, something like Mount Rushmore, for example, that's very imageable, but that's not an urban environment. So in, this, in the sense of an urban environment, I think it would, be, would have to be a man-made kind of structure. Yes? The what tower? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a good example. Um, yes, other. Yeah, the Balboa Island Ferry, that that's could be a could be an element that makes Irvine imageable, yes. Yeah, the Grand Canyon, very image. It's not, although it's not an urban element. We're talking in terms of urban environment. So think of structures that, you know, are, is, is, think of that, is the Grand Canyon a point of reference? Not in the sense of an urban environment, for example. It's not within an urban environment. Yes, other questions or other examples? A landmarks need to be, need to be individual things or individual structures, but imageability considers the, a gamut of, um, of structures and elements. So different shapes of buildings and types of buildings, old structures, beautiful architecture, they all add to the imageability of the environment, of the urban environment. 
Other questions, examples, thoughts, anything? Yes. Yes, the DC mall area, exactly. I'll, I'm going there, so yeah, that's, that's right. That's a really great example of imageability and also landmarks. Yes, Staples Center. Sorry, not familiar. Mark, do you know anything about the Staples Center? <laughs> Don't think of being imageable? No. Yeah. Depends if you're a Laker fan or not. <laughs> <laughs> so legibility, another concept that Kevin Lynch came up with was uh, in terms of describing urban environments and the qualities of urban environments was the ease with which the parts of an environment can be recognized or organized in a coherent pattern. So some cities are more legible, he found, than others. So for example, New York City, with its grid structure, was found to be more legible to people in their cognitive maps as compared to Irvine, for example, which is not organized in that kind of intuitive fashion. Um, do you, what do you think about that? What, any, any examples of legible cities versus not very legible cities? Do you think it's easy to negotiate UCI as an environment, easy to structure it? Yes, it is actually, you know, because it's all, it seems to me at least, you know, and I'm not very good at negotiating environments, so it's, it's organized around this, this, um, this Aldrich Park, and you know, and that, and I actually the, um, the planners and designers of UC Irvine very much used Kevin Lynch's concepts in designing uh, UC Irvine in terms to make it you know, legible and uh, coherent. Right. So cognitive maps are one way of uh, understanding people's perceptions of their environments. There are other ways of doing this. So for example, how do you measure imageability in an environment? So these are two examples of Im image, high imageability versus low imageability environments. High imageability places have a lot of pedestrians, um, strong landmarks. So Times Square in New York City, uh, for example, is a very imageable place compared to this uh, nondescript kind of place which could be anywhere, nothing unique, doesn't have any character, no pedestrians, a uh, few features, no outdoor dining, for example. Uh, and no landmarks, no interesting architectures. That's why it is low in imageability. Another example of measuring imageability is recording the shape of buildings. So for example, <laughs> rectangular shapes, uh, you know, straight lines versus curved shapes, different sizes and dimensions of buildings, for example. Um, you know, aspects, aspect ratios from, from uh, the car, how does it look? from the car as opposed to walking across the streets. These are all aspects of uh, measuring the imageability of an urban environment. So social imageability, this brings us to the concept of social imageability. And we've been talking about how cognitive maps are very individual and you know, um, each one has his own or her own and uh, they're guided by our own experiences and thoughts and values of the environment and also our social status. But Milgram and Jodelet, when they studied the psychological maps of Paris, actually found that, you know, you could have unique cognitive maps, but what you find important and what is salient in your mind and what is highlighted uh, within an environment by you is very much guided by what is important and highlighted by the community. So they found out that, you know, cities or the perception of a city is a social fact and as such needs to be studied as a collective as well as an individual as aspect. It is not only what exists, but what is highlighted by the community that acquires salience in the mind of the person. So how did they really figure this out? You know? So we'll talk about some of their studies and experiments. So they, they did, out of a number of studies uh, on, on the city of Paris and Parisian tourists and residents, uh, residents of different types, different socioeconomic status, different education levels, occupations. And one of their studies um, was this last walk technique. So they asked um, the, their sample to um, draw a map. And they said, that you, well, you are going to be exiled from Paris and um, you have only one last chance to take a walk across the city. And they gave them um, an unmarked ma map of the city and asked them to trace a route that they would take to uh, in their last walk, and that's why they called it the last walk technique. And what they found was that invariably there are 3,500 streets in Paris, and if cognitive maps were so idiosyncratic, we would see all of these different types of routes and places depending on people's thoughts and values. But what was found was that 
a large number of people highlighted this, this area, which is this dark highlighted area in the map, in their maps. The route around Champs-Élysées, the River Seine, the uh, Ile de la Cité, you know, these famous places in Paris which are very important to the community. So what they found out and, and they concluded was that our perceptions of our city are guided by what is socially, culturally, and historically important. And that's why a city is a social fact. And this is just another example of uh, how they organize their data. So the places uh, in, the, in people's map that were uh, highlighted the most are in a larger font. So the River Seine, the Eiffel Tower, Etoile, uh, Champs-Élysées, these were places that, were, that came out to be most prominent in the cognitive maps of Parisians. What do you think is the difference between, or the relationship between social imageability and imageability? Although the social imageability brings out uh, physical elements in people's map, but it is guided by these social, cultural, historical values and experiences. Whereas imageability focuses more on the physical elements of a city. Excellent. But they're related to each other. Usually, imageable places are also very socially imageable. So there's another study, which you don't have as a reading, but you know, I'll introduce it to you, by Orleans you know, in, the, in the early 70s. And he was very interested in the relationship between people's socioeconomic status and the cognitive maps that they drew. So this example is closer to, closer to home. So in, he did the study in Los Angeles where he had um, a sample of 25 residents um, from different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. So he took an African-American community in Avalon and he had a Spanish-speaking community in Boyle Heights and then he had the Westwood community which is predominantly Caucasian. And he asked them to draw these cognitive maps. And this is what he found. This is the Westwood area, which is upper middle class. And that's the Spanish speaking area. That's an example of a map. And this is uh, uh, the city, Los Angeles city, as perceived by residents in Avalon. So what do you see up front in these maps and the differences between these categories of people? Why are these maps of people in, uh, in the so-called lower socioeconomic status in, in the Avalon area and in the Boyle Heights area, why are they so diminished and restricted? Access to public transportation, the time and the leisure time to, to be able to explore one's environment. So especially in a city like Los Angeles, um, you can't get very far without a car. So your, your, you know, the people of lower socioeconomic status, their lives are, might be uh, restricted to their neighborhoods and their workplaces and they just don't have access to these environments and the chance to explore it. So this is a provocative example of the effect of the socioeconomic status on people's cognitive maps. Okay, so we're back, you're almost to the end of the class. We'll do a class participation exercise. So I just wanted to bring you back to this, to this conceptual framework. We'll be talking, or your, I won't be, but your Professor Stokels will talk about personality and the environment in the next class. That's another part of the active cognitive uh, dyad of this conceptual framework. And we'll be talking about the Gosling uh, article in which um, um, rooms, people's bedrooms and living spaces uh, reflect their personalities, how physical environments reflect uh, individuals' personalities. And as a segue into that topic, uh, we'll do a class uh, participation exercise uh, about a different kind of environment, your oral environments and your music selection choices. So I want you all to take out a piece of paper, list your five all-time favorite songs. All right, now I want you to exchange your, your paper, your five songs with the person sitting on your left. Be a psychologist, an environmental psychologist, and make an assessment of the personality of this person based on his or her song selections. <laughs> 